Welcome to my continuing discussion on the nature of ground as we move towards antennas, getting above ground into the antennas, and uh, propagation. These are very, very uh, early, early, early stage work of a century ago where we have Marconi's antenna systems tra uh, doing transatlantic uh, connections. And we want to look at the nature of the antenna design as it was then. And note that th these antennas were massive structures, massive structures, because typically Marconi's system was working in the, let's say, uh, somewhere between 60 and 150 kilohertz, and quite often at 60 kilohertz. 60 kilohertz, let's see, that's the 5,000 meter beam, uh, 5,000 meter beam, 5,000, 5,000 meter uh, wavelength. And uh, as you may well appreciate, when you hear the common lore of put your antenna a quarter wavelength up, there were no such, th that there was, there was no antennas that tall, a quarter wavelength at 5,000 meters. Uh, they stretched high, they stretched high, but a uh, few of them even attained one-tenth of a wavelength. But we'll go into that later because we did progress to higher frequencies. And so did they a century ago, but unfortunately for them, high frequency was about 600 kilohertz. And we're still a long way from our, our own understanding of HF. Now, back then, we had what, was, what we call now the long wire antenna. It went by various other names. Uh, Barkhausen, uh, in, uh, well, certainly long wire. Uh, there's the fishbone. It's a special antenna that we'll get into. The rhombics, the Vs. Um, all of these were very, very long wire antennas in uh, measured in wavelengths, wavelengths, multiple wavelengths. And as so many of these were, uh, these, these are the long wire antennas rather than the vertical structures. The vertical structures were, were well known. And, uh, but they weren't, they weren't particularly efficient receiving antennas, as odd as that may seem. It, certainly there's, in the sense of uh, broadcast, holy, holy, uh, no. Most people's uh, antennas would be a wire out in the backyard. So we're, we're thinking in those terms. So I'm going to turn to an illustration here. Here we have our ham shack over at this end, and it's connected through a drop, down drop to a very long wire antenna that I show terminated with a resistive element. Now, the height of this antenna we're not going to worry about right now. We're more interested in the nature of the propagation of the wave progressing from left to right across the screen here as indicated by the vector. The wave front is perpendicular to the Earth except in a region very close to Earth and certainly beneath the Earth that propagation vector is downward. The angle between this and this is a diffraction going on at the ground at this point. So what we have in this region of the antenna is a tilted field. This is mentioned in much of the early literature, especially uh, Brown, Lewis, Epstein, and in, in my references to follow, they all come from antenna engineering from Laporte. 
and in it he cites that the wave front is tilted with respect to the antenna, which is to say, well, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself here. And this field is tilted. Now I have denoted down here a dotted blue line corresponding to the antenna lead above. This is uh, what would be called the image. It's, well, the image would be properly below the earth by as much as the wire above is above the earth. But thinking it of in terms of a ghost wire returning to the shack, that mirrors this wire returning to the shack. We have a two-wire connection here, and when we look at any point perpendicular to the ground, we have a potential difference of a very high potential and a very low potential. The high, the high is over here. It's been delayed by the dielectric constant of the earth below. So the characteristics of this earth is important to this, this bending phenomenon. And uh, we're more interested in the dielectrics of the ground rather than the conductivity. The conductivity is represented by the, the dashed line here, and it takes care of itself in the ground system that we've discussed before, how to attach to ground. We've found a way to successfully attach to ground at this point, and it yields us this phantom wire here and this antenna wire above. Now, these two wires create the situation of a transmission line. Two wires out, two wires supported in, the, in this virtual structure. A transmission line of a characteristic impedance of, well, back in the early days of television, uh, the two wire transmission line would be about yay wide, about as wide as this pinhead here. And that was a 300 ohm twin, twin lead. Well, that's what? Maybe a centimeter. Distance between here is in the meters. So a minimum of 100 times this measurement here, and possibly in the thousands. The more uh, the amateur radio applications of twin line are typically in wires in a separation of about this much which is about two inches, three inches. You could go greater, six inches and such. Separation of these two ranged from old 600, 450 to 900 ohms, typically. And yet, that's only several centimeters, and we're talking tens, many, many tens of meters. Well, Surprisingly, as a transmission line, the characteristic impedance of that isn't going to be much more than 1 to 2 k ohms. And we're going to terminate that transmission line over here in a resistive element. And that's done by a lot of uh, engineering uh, uh, niceties of using um, wire that is highly resistive and highly magnetic so that it dissipates uh, through eddy currents if it's magnetic, and that's steel wire. Or using, say, like nichrome, or a very high nickel wire, something that's uh, very resistive. And that would be about 1 to 2 k ohms of uh, resistive uh, capacity at, this, at the end point, such that this, this uh, structure is now a terminated twin line, transmission line, which means it's flat. It, its characteristics uh, do not change with frequency. So we can properly load a receiver or transmitter at this point with a known uh, steady fixed wideband uh, structure. In the receiving mode, with the uh, wave coming this way, we get this diffraction quality, creates the signal. Well, is it worth it? <laughs>
This is a lot of wire and we're going to come back to this because it's going to get longer. So what do I mean by longer in that previous wire, uh, or that previous diagram, the wire length was, well, in today's terms, as, as, as much wire as you had and uh, stretched out as far as you could and lifted up as high as you could. Uh, typically, a, re a receiver doesn't need all of those considerations. It can do quite well with uh, subpar antennas. But there are times when you have to exclude other signals from your receiver, and that means you need directivity. That is, your antenna needs to be looking in one direction instead of all directions. And a vertical antenna is very omnidirectional. It's listening and transmitting in all directions in the horizon in the azimuth. A long wire, however, has directivity. It'll look in one direction and will be blind to the sides. Or it'll be looking off in one direction and another and blind to everything in front of it behind it certainly, and to the sides, except out. There, there's like a cloverleaf design that emerges from uh, these. And me describing these, if, if the long wire is looking directly at you, this is going to be a fishbone antenna. It's looking directly at you. You're in the region of maximum sensitivity to it. In other words, if you moved in a circle around this antenna oriented currently directly at you, your receiver would, S meter would say S9 at this point, S7, S5, S3, S0. Similarly, S9, S7, S5, S3, S0, S0 is out here. And behind, we would have similar angle off in these directions that were uh, S9s. Or, no, no, excuse me. Uh, I'm getting, getting a little, no, it's directly behind me would be S9, and the S3s and S5s would be behind my head. So uh, the fishbone is very directive in this sense, and deaf or mute in, this, in these directions. We'll get that. We'll get to that later. We need to progress in stages. The first stage. I'm going to return back to the drawing again. Is with this figure here, and this shows nothing of directivity. This shows nothing. Well, it does show directivity. In other words, the wavefront is progressing along the antenna. The antenna mimics an untuned transmission line. Potential difference caused by the ground in proximity uh, gives us the signal and the other characteristics that I'm going to present to you next in these in this in this uh, image right here. We have directivity patterns for a wire. I'm we're going to start up in the upper left hand corner here of this figure. These are field patterns. These are field patterns to that previous wire. Now the wire is oriented in this direction, top to bottom. So the wire runs in this direction. And you'll note in this plan, this is an overview of that wire. These are the lobes that I spoke of, the sensitivities. Uh, that, again, my, the, what I spoke to earlier was about the fishbone. This is not the fishbone. This is just a simple wire. In the simple wire, it's telling us that in this direction, along its length, it's, it's deaf. This curve represents the signal strength at some distant point at this angle. This is the maximum signal strength that you can expect from, from something out here. Uh, 
from something up here, zip. Zip point, not a nothing. You're deaf. You won't hear it at all. However, if we move the source over to here, radio and, uh, transmitter, and it was approaching you from this angle, yeah, uh, we would uh, see a, about what? 12 and a half units of strength with this scale in this, in this area. Now, the purpose of all these uh, diagrams is to illustrate the change of this directivity. In other words, regions I cannot hear and regions I can. Regions I cannot talk to, regions that I can. As the wire length increases, here, we're, here we are at, at one half wavelength of wire. So returning to this, this is a half wave, half wave of wire. If an, a signal was coming along at the, directly in line with it, we wouldn't hear anything uh, in spite of all the uh, uh, diffraction angles that I've taken here. The properties of this antenna uh, don't allow for that at one half wave, well, at any length basically, until we get exceptionally long. However, Returning to uh, my chart here, this long wire would listen to either either side of it. If I were to increase its length, that angle is going to change from what I said about 45 degrees here. 45 degrees with respect to this wire here. With respect to the longer wire now, it is now four half wavelengths long. That's a considerable change. We're now verging on about 35 degree angle from from the length from the axis of the wire. In other words, we can hear signals that are closer to the center line than before. Previously, it was in this region or in this region here, 45 degrees out. Now at 35, 33 degrees out, we can hear from these regions or we can transmit to these regions in orientation to the wire running in this direction. And we have a higher, what's, not, what's called gain. Gain in re with respect to this, this was 12 and a half. Now we're verging on 30. Nearly double the gain for an increase of wire length of uh, basically four times as much as we, four, four times as much wire. We do this, uh, we do the remainder of these uh, charts go to explore how these lobes develop to this progression of being eight half wavelengths long and now we have 40, 40 plus units of uh, field strength for the same signal but now at even a closer angle to bore line. So this is, uh, well, it's not terribly closer than up here but again, it's another uh, 10, 10 units of gain, either in emission strength to the sa same uh, location or t uh, an additional gain of 10 to receiving a, a signal from that location over, certainly well over this one. So this is the virtue of adding more wire, yet more wire, to a long wire antenna is these lobes get sharper, longer, and closer to the run of wire. Now you don't need to aim in, uh, you need to know these properties of these angles to aim your wire correctly to, to areas that you want to uh, establish a QSO. However, we don't always have uh, these options. But back in the early days, it's what they worked with. So we're going to move on and look at some of these applications.
Here we have the fishbone antenna that I spoke of. And this is following the metaphor that I already established earlier. Except here we have two true wire. We have the receiver down at this end, or, or transmitter. Again, uh, for transmit applications, this, this structure is so tightly bound with earth that it's very lossy. However, as a receive antenna, it's not such a, a, a primary matter of concern. Uh, as a uh, standard uh, homily of uh, antenna design, we have what's called reciprocity. In other words, most antennas work this, have the same characteristics in either direction, either in receive or transmit. However, uh, we're at, the, we're at the very limits of that, uh, that advice. But working with that, we have a twin lead that's running in this direction. In the, we're, we're gonna, we're gonna, okay, I'm gonna return to this. I'm gonna say that this is a twin lead now. And it's being fed by a twin lead going up. We're going to ignore this ground path. It's still there. It hasn't gone away, but we're not working across these two wires. We're going to be working across two elevated wires. And they are these. So this is the, 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 the antenna run that I've illustrated before. But now I'm hanging elements off of those, well, I'm not hanging, they're not falling to ground, they're being spread out. So there's a very lot of wire here, there's supports at each of these points, or some web of uh, uh, a line that runs along this length that is supported at far ends. They'll need their masts to support the strain of pulling this wire out and this wire in this direction. So, very complex structure. You have to want this. And why would you? Well, speaking more, we've, we have our termination resistor. means that this twin lead is now flat. It exhibits no resonance. We have these elements that are attached to it through capacitors feeding uh, giving us a uh, potential difference that moves along. This is, again, a traveling wave antenna. This is going to be distinct from topics that we discuss later called standing wave antennas, which are uh, more familiar to you. But as again, a hundred years ago, traveling wave dominated um, many design considerations, and this is amongst them. As, as you'll notice, this is a 300-foot antenna for a receiver. And what did that 300 uh, feet get us? Well, it gave us a very sharp lobe. This is the azimuth view. And it gave us a nice takeoff angle, or receive angle. This is the elevation view of the antenna. The elevation view reveals that the takeoff or receive angle, and this is from skip, is on the order of 25, 25 degrees or slightly less, 22 and a half degrees. The overhead or azimuthable view shows that the lobe is oh, roughly, well we measure the lobe width at the half power points. And as this is a linear scale, and this is half, that would be 6 dB down. This is going to be roughly 3 dB down. These two 3 dB points are separated by 30 degrees. So this would be a 30 degree beam width antenna. The, the launch lobe, similarly, would be, have about a, uh, a similar 30 degree beam width launching in this direction. Now you might ask, well, what what can what what 
I, you may understand how this selectivity allows us to listen and speak to stations oriented here and stations oriented to this side will get very, very, very uh, poor performance. In other words, this is not a link you want to establish in this direction or in this direction. The signal, the strength level is one-tenth of what it is out here. So 10 to the same, this signal at, a, let's say, a one watt uh, source at this distance uh, would sound like a one-tenth watt transmitter. A one watt source at this point would sound like a one watt transmitter. So one watt here, one watt over here is received and worked with a poorer uh, connection than in this direction. And this is indeed along the, the bore line of the wire. So this is straight down the length of the wire. The wire is pointing at what you want to talk to or listen to. This is the wire running in this across and it is sending a signal up into the air at a roughly 25 degree, 22 and a half degree angle. And this is the launch angle that most amateurs seek. Uh, typically they want a launch angle as low as possible, maybe five degrees. Five degrees is the classic uh, angle for uh, uh, many 160 meter contacts. It's going to take a lot of groundwork to, to uh, accomplish that, but here we have uh, here we have the fishbone and its qualities. Here we have a V antenna. hundred years ago it was called the RCA Model G antenna. And again we have two twin lines diverging from this feed point. The feed point is fed by a twin line. So again, we're back into the balanced uh, load design of, of uh, well, what was emulated in this structure. This is an off, an unbalanced twin line because unbalanced because it's uh, referenced to ground instead of being isolated from ground. In this situation. This is balanced with respect to the lead lines that are f being fed. Uh, this bears looking at the feed point to uh, see the uh, particular uh, uh, things that we need to observe because it's not quite obvious at this level, but we're not going to concern ourselves with that. But we're going to note that as this is a long wire, now a long twin lead, that mimics my earlier representation, that it also conforms that the best radiation sources are off at an angle to it. Off in this angle and off on this angle. Now you'll note that my cursor is moving along the same line that this is. This portion of the radiation element, it too has side lobes in that direction and in this direction. So this element's right lobe is along this axis. This element's left lobe is along this axis and they both add and these two side lobes are, well, they're, they're significant, but they're minor in relation to the gain that we've just found, discovered. We've doubled the gain in this direction, and our antenna is now oriented as a balanced structure in this direction. We can then add complexity to this by inserting a reflector behind it. So these are two, two, two systems, 
nested one inside the other. So you might think of this, this is called the Model D, RCA's Model D antenna. You might think of this as an early uh, uh, two-element dipole. It's, there's other things that are going on between these two feed points to maintain that, uh, that model. And there's some wavelength uh, shifting going on. It's, it's hidden behind the curtain. We're not going to discuss that. So suffice it to say that if we could do this once, add the left lobe of this to the right lobe of this to create a, a major lobe going in the, this direction, then we can do it again and create a mirror of the V, and this is called a horizontal rhombic antenna. Uh, this is called a, uh, a standard three-wire form, but we're not going to get lost in the weeds with uh, that. We're just going to, I'm going to step back and look at the feeder from here. The transmitter is at this end, and we have our lossy termination at this end. It's composed of this rather unusual structure down here, which is nothing more than lossy wire nichrome connected to the ends between these two points. These two points, these two wires, these two structures here that mirror each other are a two-wire transmission line that has been spread open to these supports and then drawn together at this support and terminated by this resistor. This is just a resistor. As, as this is a transmission line and it's terminated in its characteristic impedance down here, it re exhibits a flat response across frequencies of about 2 to 1, or depending upon this element here, length. And this element length is typically minimally one wavelength long. So this is another wavelength. This would be minimally a two wavelength long antenna. However, a century ago they were working in multiples of wavelengths out to, well, as we'll see, ten wavelengths. And this comes from this uh, graph here. This is the optimum parameters for the horizontal uh, rhombic and leg length in term of wavelengths. So we have the minimum one wavelength out to eight wavelengths. Now what's this telling me? What, what, why would I go longer? Uh, well, I'm at this lower part, I'm interested in the elevation of the main beam. In other words, the launch angle. The launch angle for a one wavelength uh, element is about 18 degrees. And that's that's quite that's that's uh, that's a very good uh, launch angle. However, 10 is better, but we have to be six wavelengths long for each of those elements, or 12 long 12 wavelengths long for the entire structure. We can go out longer, but. Uh, just to gain one more degree of uh, lowering the uh, beam, one more degree. That's a, that's a long haul, and it doesn't show much, uh, uh, much uh, return for us. So we, the, long, the shortest gives us 18 degrees, two wavelengths give us about 18 degrees, uh, let's say we get out four wavelengths, five wavelengths, we're into the 10 degree regimen. That's, that's, that's a good payback for the effort involved, but more? I don't think so. We have other considerations of uh, uh, I'm not going to go into those right now. It relates to this, this chart above here tells us how wideband the antenna is. I, I mentioned it was two to one at uh, 
basically eight, eight wavelengths. It's 0.4 to 1.6, which is more than 2 to 1. But this gives you a bandwidth in terms of the operating frequency that's in this center point. So if this was 600 kilohertz that we were working, this at an eight wavelength element, 16 wavelength antenna, our maximum, we could shift frequencies from 600 kilohertz to oh, about one and a half megahertz or down to oh, 300 kilohertz or less, maybe 200 kilohertz. 200 kilohertz to 1.2 uh, megahertz. That's quite a, quite a wide ranging antenna. And it's going to uh, give you these kinds of performance characteristics. So let's see, anything else here? No, that's back to where we were before. So that's a quick run through of uh, work from Brown Lewis and Epstein, and uh, principally in this portion from Laporte in his book on antenna, antenna engineering. Uh, these are classic images from a classic work. This is, uh, this is we're still at ground level. We haven't uh, erected a vertical except of very rudimentary ones. There's much to be said about the characteristics of, of the vertical antenna, and we'll get into those uh, coming up soon, and more, uh, more about uh, propagation and such. So, 73s.